Welcome back, everyone. We saw how Paul is being interrogated. But before we go further, there'll be more interrogation, more people coming into the picture. I want to ask you, is there any fulfillment of prophecy in what is going on right now? Do you recall any word over Paul's life that is being fulfilled right now? You can turn your pages and check. Um, um, ma'am, Agabus prophesied about Paul being bound. Correct. Okay. So Agabus prophesied. Um, he said that uh, the man whose belt this is be bound and showed no that he will be bound in Jerusalem. Yes, that is one prophecy. Any other prophecy? Prophetic word. Just uh, think carefully. You can even turn your pages and look up some portions. Anyone? I just want to check whether we are in sync. I know a lot of things are unfolding, but um, with the incidents, God's work, the leading of the Holy Spirit, the fulfillment of the prophetic word, many such things are also taking place, which we shouldn't miss. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, Agabus, correct. That that is there. In chapter twenty one, uh -huh. um and he was at uh, Philip place. Mm. Mm. So yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's true. So the daughters also, uh, I mean, he was at Philip's place. They were prophetic. And there only Agabus came. And he prophesied this uh, matter regarding him being bound. And you're right. This one matter was prophesied several times. First, he only had that impression, like chains await you. Then uh, the brothers in Tyre, the brethren in Tyre, when he was journeying through, they also emotionally, they told him, don't go, Paul. Uh, you know. So a lot of people told him about the same matter, that he will be bound. But I'm asking you, apart from that, that he will be imprisoned if he goes to Jerusalem, apart from this word, is there any other prophetic word which is being fulfilled right now. Okay, let me, uh, all of you are, you know, and there will be too many names and places and all this confusing sometimes uh, if you could recall when we talked about uh, ananias the the person who came and prayed for paul in acts chapter 9 uh, when paul had the encounter uh, with jesus on the road to damascus uh, we don't see uh, the lord jesus say a lot of things to him about what he must 
uh, what he must do when you know Paul he asks uh, Jesus Lord what do you want me to do he is given one instruction you go to the city and there you will be told what you must do but to Ananias it is revealed so this is in uh, verse 15 but God says about Paul to Ananias go for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Okay, uh, and verse 16, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So can we, can we uh, uh, reconcile with this word and see that it's being fulfilled now? Because Paul is that chosen vessel to, who is bearing the name of Jesus. He's standing before Gentiles. Who is Felix? He's a Gentile. And kings. Kings, uh, well, we could put the whole category of authorities. He stood before the Sanhedrin. He's standing before the governor. He will stand before many others, you know, going forward. So he's being fulfilled. He also spoke about Jesus to the children of Israel. To so many Jews, he's testifying. So prophecies are being fulfilled. And he's undergoing a lot of sufferings for the name of Jesus. So the fulfillment of God's word is actually happening as you see Paul standing before these authorities. And he's not ashamed to proclaim the name of Jesus, even to these governors. So bold, isn't it? When he was in the uh, when he was uh, being accused uh, in Jerusalem, like the temple, uh, when he got caught, he still preached about Jesus. He is under the governor, uh, Felix. He's still talking to him about Jesus so that even Felix and Drusilla would accept Jesus Christ. Now, there are questions. Did these people accept Christ? We don't know. Luke doesn't mention anything about it. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's any comment in the epistles of Paul later on so did these people become christians we have to look at other comments only uh, to to see what exactly happened okay but the point is he took every opportunity to proclaim jesus christ uh, so where were we now uh, in chapter 24 under governor felix the whole uh, you know uh, argument of the case you had Ananias, the high priest, coming with his gang and his speaker, Tertullus, making the case, Paul defending himself, uh, Felix noticing that there's actually nothing here to, to solve, uh, but still dragging the case, okay, uh, maybe with an expectation of money. So two years Paul is here, and uh, the governor finally changed. So there is a new governor by the name of Festus. So chapter 25 is about Festus. Festus, uh, while he's interrogating the case of uh, Paul, he will have a visitor. Who is that visitor? There will be uh, King Herod, who will be visiting him. King Agrippa, okay? Uh, he, uh, he is part of that Herod family. And Bernice, Bernice uh, is uh, his, his partner. But then we'll see that even this relationship is an incest relationship, whereas, um, you know, it, it's not right in the sight of God that Bernice is his uh, wife. So anyway, Paul will address, Paul will speak about uh, Jesus Christ to even these people in authority. So that's what we are going to see. Now let's come to chapter 25. Excuse me. And here, uh, Festus, oh, he has to take up Paul's matter, uh, but then there's a little bit of uh, traveling okay, that he's involved in. So the chapter begins with, now when Festus had come to the province, after three days, he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. So this person, uh, his office is in Caesarea, but he goes up to Jerusalem. There, the high priest and the chief men of the Jews informed him against Paul. So look at these people. It's been two years, but they are still trying their best to get Paul caught back in Jerusalem. Okay? So their plan is, if we put a word against Paul to Festus, Felix did not 
work for us. How about Festus? Maybe he will close the case in our favor. So they petition him. They ask him for uh, a favor. And uh, you know they want to finish off Paul. right? But Festus answered that Paul should be kept in Caesarea. He's not allowing for uh, Paul to be murdered. Now, obviously, they, they also hinted that if Paul can be brought to Jerusalem, uh, you know, they, he can be easily killed. But uh, Festus says, no, we will not move him out of uh, Caesarea and uh, that he would go back to Caesarea and deal with the case. Right. So um, then finally, Festus comes back to Caesarea. Um, and uh, he wants to inquire with Paul what exactly is going on. So he asks, he checks with Paul, and here is Paul's answer. We can look at it in verse 8 of chapter 25, uh, where Paul says that neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I offended in anything at all. So he is uh, again going by the earlier statements that he made that he has done his best to live right. He's not giving offense to uh, either, uh, you know, like the religious authorities, which is the Jews, uh, the, the religious authorities, or the religious people. He's not giving any offense to the temple, uh, and neither is he giving any offense to the land or the law of the land. So he's quite clear about these matters. Uh, but then, though Paul is clarifying this matter, somewhere Festus, right? Uh, what has happened to Festus? He was in Jerusalem where people tried to talk to him. The Jews over there tried to talk to him against Paul. So we understand regarding Festus that somewhere in his heart, he wanted to do the Jews a favor. Okay, uh, so he he was trying to find a way to convict Paul and close off this case. So uh, Paul is presenting a defense, uh, but Festus slowly he is trying to kind of uh, check whether there is any opportunity of uh, sending him back to Jerusalem. So that you know, once he goes there, let the Jews do whatever they want to do. Uh, if, if they want to kill him, uh, if they want to convict him, up to them. At least he has done something in the favor of the Jews, and uh, you know he will be out of this situation. So that that's where he is at. But by this point, Paul is quite upset. Okay, he's like, neither did Felix solve my problem for two years. Now Festus, he's playing a double game, listening a little bit to the Jews. And though he has inputs from Paul, not solving the case. So when Paul realizes that like this, my situation is not going to get better, he plays that card of the Roman citizen once again. OK? So he tells Festus, um, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat at verse 10. I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you very well know, for I am an offender. For if I am an offender or have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. So uh, this is something that a Roman citizen could do uh, in, you know, it, it's like in, a, in our country in India, we have uh, the lower courts uh, and, you know, then you have the state court, the high court that we could appeal to. But ultimately, we have the central uh, court, which is the Supreme Court. So when we take matters to the Supreme Court, it's like the ultimate authority that has to solve the problem. So uh, Paul realizes that you know his life is at risk, and these men are not doing anything to uh, protect him or even resolve the matter. So he he appeals to the highest court. So he says, "I appeal to Caesar. Caesar is who? Caesar is the the ruler, 
right of the Roman Empire. And uh, he says, uh, because I'm a Roman citizen, I'm eligible. I can go straight away to the Supreme Court. That's, you know, in, in our understanding, that's what it means. So he wants to go up to Caesar and have his matter solved. So when he makes this statement to Festus, Festus is stuck. Now Festus thought that he will slowly do a favor to the uh, Jews in Jerusalem by sending Paul back over there and dragging the case. But the moment Paul says, I appeal to Caesar, Festus has, has no other op option. Right? He has to take it up. So in verse 12, Festus says, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. Ultimately, you know, uh, when, when this appeal is made, they're supposed to send them to Caesar. So now one decision is made. What is that decision? Paul has to go to Rome. Okay. That is the place where his problem or you know this whole issue, the case, will be resolved. So um, Festus also is no longer in charge of Paul's case. He has to pack Paul up now and send him to Rome. That is the conclusion, finally, in chapter 25. But before sending him to Rome, there is a visitor who comes you know, uh, to Festus's uh, uh, sort of, what do you say? He was in the Praetorium, right? Herod's Praetorium. So over there, you have Agrippa visiting at that point. So we'll see what exactly happens when Agrippa comes by. OK, so all this you just have to imagine. Uh, I don't know if you're able to imagine. I always imagine you now he went from Jerusalem, he's in Caesarea. It must have been, uh, you know, something like a, like a court or a, a place where he was kept and all these interrogations are taking place. Uh, and uh, now you have Agrippa also coming to that particular place and uh, visiting Festus. Okay, so it's like a movie. It should run in your mind about the events that are unfolding. But in God's calendar and in God's sight, the prophetic words are being fulfilled. So the kings are coming, right? So Agrippa comes. Who is Agrippa? Um, uh, he is Herod Agrippa, actually. So though over here it only says Agrippa, uh, we would his name is Herod Agrippa II. And he ruled one of the, uh, you know, he the client kingdom of the Roman Empire. Uh, and uh, this Festus and his province came under Agrippa, which is why he could actually visit. So Agrippa was known for uh, um, his Jewish customs and uh, you know he he had a he had a love for Jewish customs and religions uh, traditions so that is what he was known for and uh, he just came by to visit and I'm sure you know he would be interested to hear directly from Paul because Paul was quite famous so he may have wanted to hear from Paul um, you know about what this new faith of his is all about but another interesting fact about this person. Agrippa, Herod Agrippa II is, he was the uh, great-grandson of Herod who was in the time when, you remember Jesus, when Jesus was born, the babies were being killed and so many things you hear of. So his grand great-grandfather uh, was that wicked person who was killing the, uh, the babies. Right? So he comes from that tradition of uh, very aggressive rulers uh, who went against the purposes of God. So, yeah, we don't really, we're not really expecting for Herod to come in and uh, solve this problem at all. Fine, let's see what happens when this Herod comes to visit. Okay, so I told you. He came, Agrippa, he came with Bernice. Bernice, uh, is, he's, she's actually meant to be his sister, but you know he, uh, he married her, which is actually not the way we're supposed to get married. But 
yeah, that, that's what happened. So they came to Caesarea to greet Festus. And uh, there was something like a, a what do you say? Uh, visit is not the word, but like a day that is fixed and a ceremony, actually, a ceremony where they are welcoming Agrippa in a very grand way. So uh, they, they are hosting him over there. So let's uh, probably just read through. It's self-explanatory, right? I want to really need to explain it for us. So we could read from the place where he arrives. Okay, fine. We think we will have to read from verse uh, 13. Could somebody pick it up from verse 13? And you'll have to read it till 27. I'll go ahead. Yeah. Acts chapter 25, verse 13. And after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to Festus. When they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a certain man left a prisoner by Felix, but about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews told me when I was in Jerusalem, asking for a judgment against him. To them I answered, It is not the of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction before the accused meet the accusers to face as opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charge against them. Therefore, when they had come together without any delay, the next day I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. Until 25. When, okay. When the accusers stood up and they brought no accusations against them of such thing as I supposed, but had some questions against them about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who had died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and yet be judged concerning these matters. But when Paul appealed to be restored for the decision of Augustus, commanded him to be kept and Till I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So the next day when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men of the city at Festus' command, Paul was brought. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who are here present with us, you see this man for whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. When I found that he had committed nothing disgusting of death and that he himself had appealed to August, I decided to send him. I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore, I have him out before you, especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to specify the charges against him. So as I stated, it's quite self-explanatory. Uh, Festus shares about this matter to Agrippa, and then Agrippa himself comes with great pomp uh, in the presence of all the other leaders, and uh, he wants to hear Paul out. So now Paul is going to talk to Agrippa okay, and make his defense. Now, why all this ordeal of uh, trying to listen uh, to Paul? Because you see, Paul has appealed to Caesar. And before sending to Caesar, they need to explain why they are sending to Caesar. They don't have an accusation against him. So funny, isn't it? That you have a prisoner for over two years and you're not able to specify what is the accusation against this man that you've kept him over here. So 
this issue pestis shares with agripa and says like can you help me now because something i have to write down before i send him to caesar so agripa says okay come on let's listen to this man and let's figure out you know what what is the that one point we can mention in the letter so now we come to chapter 26 where paul has the opportunity to go ahead and speak okay so paul speaks and uh, you know he narrates uh, regarding his own life again he he talks about how um, you know he is part of the jews his upbringing he was brought up under the strict sect of the religion and he lived as a pharisee so he's giving an ex, uh, explanation of his upbringing and uh, you know later on he also talks regarding uh, the hope that he has in christ he talks about uh, uh, you know the the faith that he has he says how it's he is not opposing the faith of the jews so then he puts a question uh, to uh, you know agrippa that look i am believing in these matters uh, and in, just because i'm believing in these matters like what is it that i have done wrong okay and uh, paul's faith is so strong that he says people are accusing uh, you know those who believe uh, for the miracles that take place and uh, the, the healings that take place the uh, resurrection from the dead that takes place you know why is it such a great thing for us that you know god even raises the dead this is a this is a wonderful statement that paul makes in verse 8 if you notice he says that why should it be thought incredible to you that god raises the dead again coming back to that matter of resurrection which he told the council and he also told felix and even now he says i am a pharisee i believe in resurrection of the dead why is it such a great matter for us you know, can god not raise the dead these are the things that i believe in okay uh and he also states how he was actually a persecutor of uh, uh, jesus and and his people but how god actually encountered him and his life changed so he gives a clarification uh, and he recounts his uh, experience of how he encountered jesus so that whole narration is that it's like a repetition of acts chapter 9 where uh, you know he saw that bright light and jesus spoke to him uh, it it's really nice to listen to it all over again actually uh, because you know you might find an insight or two again in the narration so just for that sake i'm going to read it out what he's telling to uh, agrippa about that encounter on the road to damascus so i'll read from verse 12 where he says uh, while thus occupied as i journeyed to damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests at midday o king along the road i saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me very interesting because we're talking about the middle east so the middle east sun we we know that oh those places are so hot uh in around noon time the sun must be so bright but he's saying brighter than the sun midday so what kind of a light did he encounter something amazing isn't it so he saw very very bright light was 14 and when we all had fallen to the ground i heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the hebrew language saul saul why have you why are you persecuting me it is hard for you to kick against the goads so i said who are you lord and he said i am jesus whom you are persecuting but rise and stand on your feet for i have appeared to you for this purpose to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which i will yet reveal to you i will deliver you from the jewish people as well as from the gentiles to whom i now send you 
to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So this narrated the incident and the most uh, one of the scriptures that I want us to focus on is verse 18. Okay. Very powerful, very powerful uh, scripture there. What does it say? It says, here is the, uh, the function or the assignment of Paul. But you know something? It's not just his assignment. It's all our assignment to bring people to Christ. That is the great commission, actually. But Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel. Right? Teach them everything that I have taught you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, behold, I am with you even to the end of the age. So to proclaim the gospel, what does the gospel do? There are other aspects here. It says, open their eyes. So they are able to see who God is, how God loves them. What is the great purpose for which God has called them? Now we know, Paul also talks about this in other epistles where he says, that those who don't know Christ, those who are not born again, they're spiritually dead. And also in 1 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he says that the God of this world, he has blinded their eyes. So the spiritual eyes are blind of those who are not born again. But what is our mandate? The Great Commission, open the eyes, open the eyes of the people so that they can know Christ. Okay, So that is a responsibility which was given to Paul. It's also given to us and see how beautiful it continues in order to turn them from darkness to light. Why did, did Jesus come? That's why he came to, uh, you know, lead people in that path of life. He came to give us abundant life, help us to walk in that abundant life. Same thing Paul is saying. What is the gospel? It is going to turn people from darkness to light. That's what is going to happen when we preach the gospel and then he says from the power of satan to god remember how to the romans paul writes he says that um, you know we, we are no longer slaves of sin that that power of sin over our lives is broken right now we are the righteousness of god in christ jesus so he teaches us here that what is salvation we are no longer slaves of satan but we come under the power of God. From the power of Satan to God. That is what salvation is all about. That they may receive forgiveness of sins. Okay, that we understand. Salvation. A part of salvation is forgiveness of sins. And an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in God. Right? So he is actually stating about the great commission how God called him to that, but we can see for ourselves that this is what we are also called to do. So he talks about this to Agrippa. Then, uh, you know, he talks a little bit about what happened to him after he gave his life to Christ. So from verse 16, therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Okay? One thing is the calling. Second thing is the responding to the calling. So he says, look, I responded. I responded. I was not disobedient. When God told me to do these things, I did it. And was 20, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God and do works befitting repentance. For these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand, witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. So he's just saying that I've been doing the same work, I've been talking about Jesus, I've been talking about what he has done, 
proclaiming it to everyone. Okay. Now, let's see, uh, you know, what would be the response of Agrippa? What was Felix's response? Come at a convenient time. That is Felix's response. Festus, so far, no response regarding the uh, matter of salvation. Now, Agrippa has heard the gospel. What is going to be his response? Let's see. Verse 24. Now, as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. So, Festus is not able to receive this message. Right? Uh, and of course, you know, uh, Paul gives a defense. He says, I'm not mad. Okay. I'm convinced about whatever I'm uh, saying. Then he directly asks Agrippa in verse 27. He says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. What did I share earlier? Agrippa. Herod Agrippa too, he was interested in Jewish customs. Okay, so Paul knew this and he's directly asking Agrippa, Do you believe the prophets? Do you believe? Okay, uh, I know that you believe in them. So if Agrippa believes in the prophets, he should believe that the prophets were the ones who prophesied about Jesus, isn't it? So now, what is Agrippa going to say? The ball is in Agrippa's court. Agrippa. Is saying, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. So, what Agrippa is saying is, Paul, I'm not finding anything wrong in what you're saying. I'm almost at the door. Now, tell me for salvation, being almost at salvation but not entering, is it good enough? When people come in, it's like Felix only. Come at a convenient time. It's somewhat like that. When Agrippa is saying, I'm not, his answer is not, I believe. He doesn't say that. He says, Paul, you almost convinced me to be a Christian. But that's not going to help one experience salvation. It's a definite decision that one needs to make, whether we are born again or we are not born again. Even Agrippa is sitting on the fence. He's not making the decision. So Paul responds to him. He says in verse 29, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these claims. Meaning, you should be a you should become a believer, Agrippa, and everyone should. Okay, so that's what he's telling Agrippa now so very boldly. And verse 13, when he had said these things, the king stood up, as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. And when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, this man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. Then Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So according to Agrippa, he has evaluated the case. And he feels that he should actually be set free. But unfortunately, what has already happened, Paul has appealed to Caesar. So he has to go to Rome. That matter is fixed. Okay. But now let's come to the more important question about the salvation of Festus and Agrippa. They don't accept Christ at that point. Now, did they accept Christ later on? For that, we don't have a clear-cut answer, at least from the Bible, we don't have. So uh, it's really sad that uh, these great men, they heard the gospel, but they did not respond. Right? Uh, and yeah, it's, it's just so sad that even when Paul himself preached to them, they didn't say, I believe or I repent. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll stop right here because the last two chapters are more about the voyage. There'll be a journey that Paul makes and uh, you know, it, it, it's it's again like a movie only. Like the ship will go and there'll be like a wreckage uh, and all and then he will safely land on an island. 
and uh, eventually he'll go on to Rome, he'll do some ministry in Rome. So all that is going to happen. So we can talk about it together uh, and then talk a little bit about the timelines, right? Because we need to know what the years are all about and what are some of the uh, uh, the epistles that Paul wrote uh, in and through his journey. So all that we'll look into in the next class. So hopefully the next Friday class is our last class. Um, and uh, yeah, so we could stop at uh, this point here after looking at the defense that Paul makes for himself, both in Jerusalem and in Caesarea. Okay, so uh, before we close with the word of prayer, any thoughts or any comments about what you've heard so far? OK, so I suppose, OK, okay. praise God. Yeah, I'm glad to know that uh, you know, the information is helping you. Think about these things. Think about what Paul might have gone through. It really gives us a deeper understanding about uh, what and all people have suffered to, to kind of pass on this uh, mandate to us. So. Let's pray and uh, we can close for today. Okay, let me just pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the records of uh, the lives of your people, especially Lord Apostle Paul. And uh, Lord, the way today we read, he says, I was not obedient, disobedient to the heavenly vision, King Agrippa. Father God, thank you, Lord, for men and women of God who have been obedient to what God has called them to do. That, uh, Lord, today we, we stand, Lord, on their shoulders. Father, we thank you for their lives, their examples, Lord, that strengthen us. Father, help us, Lord, to also be obedient to the call of God on our, on our lives. Lord, strengthen us, Father God. Give us the grace. Anoint us, Father. And Lord, we just pray that in our generation, Father God, that we too will be bold, uh, Lord, and how beautiful to see that uh, even though kings and uh, Lord, uh, many authorities are examining him, they are not finding any fault, Lord, with, with uh, Paul, Lord, such a man of uh, integrity and commitment. Father God, uh, enable us, Lord, to uh, pattern our lives, uh, Lord, in, in these good ways, Father, that, that we are learning. We commit ourselves into your hands, uh, Father God, and we just pray, God, that you continue to speak to us from the book of Acts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So thank you, everyone. God bless you. Uh, you can look forward to your final assignment. Okay. So all the best. God bless and bye for now. Thank you. Thank you.